We leave Genesis and Exodus, can you believe it today? And we find ourselves in the dead smack first gospel, first book of the New Testament, St. Matthew. Today we are reading from chapter 23, verses 1 through 12. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Therefore, do whatever they teach you and follow it, but do not do as they do. For they do not practice what they teach. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on the shoulders of others. But they themselves are unwilling to lift a finger to move them. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylic trees broad and their fringes long. They love to have the place of honor at banquets and the best seats in the synagogues, and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have people call them rabbi. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all students. And call no one your father on earth, for you have one father, the one in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah, the greatest among you will be a servant. All who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of God's word. Let us pray. Lord, like spandex, expand our hearts and our ears and our eyes in the finite and limitedness of our brain and our spirit to breathe you in, to breathe in the complicatedness and simplicity of this text. Speak to us, Lord, today. In Jesus' name, amen. We are beginning a worship series for the month of November. November. It's called The Gratitude Journey. The Gratitude Journey. And today, part one, we are looking at the gift of humility. The gift of humility. A group of eight people sit around a table to discuss equity in America. They have made a commitment to journey together a year long meeting together once a month for two and a half hours. They are at their second meeting, and the assignment was given to them to write down how you were taught to feel superior to or better than. Perhaps it may seem an odd question at first, but think, how are you taught to feel superior to or better than? Who were you taught to feel superior to or better than? The Jewish participant around the table speaks first. She shares she had never really thought about the question that way or about her faith that way. But having been raised Jewish, she was taught that they were the chosen people. She was taught that God favored them that they had a very special connection with God. And nobody ever said anything, but the sentiment was there, that they were superior, that they were better than. Another participant across the table, a religious Christian man speaks next. He says it hit him like a ton of bricks as he was thinking about this assignment that he had been taught to live and act in a certain way in the world. 
that he had been taught by his Christian community that they were to be in the world but not of the world, that somehow they were different, they were better, they were not going to do what those people did, they were going to heaven, but those who sinned and lived any kind of old life were going to hell. He had certainly grown up feeling like his religion kept him from going astray, but he could not get around it. That his religion had also taught him to feel superior. It was not anything that was said, but it was the unspoken. Another participant around the table says, I was taught to feel superior by my education. I have advanced degrees from really good schools. My parents paid a lot for my education. I'm able to think critically about the issues. And even today with upcoming elections, I have felt superior. I have felt like if other people just were educated, they would operate and do better and make better decisions. One by one, each of the people around the table began to realize that they had all been taught how to feel superior to others. I imagine if you really search your heart, you might find it in you too. Small, undetected, almost this feeling of somehow just being a little bit better than others. It's below the surface, but it's there. The thing about superiority is it always makes someone else feel bad. I mean, if someone is on top, then it leaves someone to be on the bottom. If someone feels better than others, it leaves someone to feel bad on the other end. I was listening to motivational speaker Bertrice Berry. One of my friends tagged her and said she's the best motivational speaker, and so I've found myself listening to her lately. And every day she leaves about a two-minute motivational speech out there. And one of them, she starts talking about how she grew up poor. Actually, there are people that grew up even poorer than poor people. And she considers herself to be in that category. You know, that category when even the poor people can point at you and make fun of you. Poor, poor. And somehow she knew it, and she was made to feel less than because of what her family did not have. And so she never invited people to her house. And when she got rides home, she always had them drop her off a couple of houses over and pretended that was her house. And she became close with a, a pastor and his family. And every week they'd bring her home, she'd have them drop her off at that other house, that other house that looked better than her house. And one week as they're driving home, she says the pastor stops the car. And he says, Bertice, we know where you live. And she began to cry, and cry, and cry. They told her, we know where you live, but that's not who you are. And they said, from now on, we're going to drive you to your home. And they drove her all the way to her home. And it felt good for Bertice to finally have someone validate her worth and to let her know that her worth had nothing to do with where she lived and how much money her parents had. I know where you live. You see, the thing with superiority is it potentially makes someone else feel inferior. Whole groups, whole people. In the biblical text today, we look at the Pharisees and they're feeling pretty superior about their knowledge. They know the law. They have observed this Jesus guy, and they don't really like Jesus that much. And they decide they're going to trap him because, of course, they study the law. That's what they do. That's their business. They get into this business of trying to trap Jesus. We're going to get that guy. But trying to trap Jesus is rooted in their privilege of their position and knowledge. It's rooted in their feeling of feeling superior. These were the guys that even when they prayed, they thanked God, <laughs> I'm glad I'm not like those folks. The Pharisees had it bad. This feeling of being better than others. And they constantly put others down. 
The text today elaborates on this more. In verse 4, it starts with, They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on the shoulders of others, but they themselves are unwilling to lift a finger to move them. They do all their deeds to be seen by others. They want attention. For they make their phylactery trees broad and their fringes long. They love to have the place of honor at the banquets. They want to sit at the best seats in the synagogues. And they want to be greeted with respect in the marketplace and to have people call them by their titles. But the Pharisees are not alone. There is a real temptation among religions, right, to feel like we are superior, that somehow we're better than. The religious rights feels like they have the monopoly on religious living. They feel superior. And the liberal left feels superior because they're educated and they're smart. In two days, we will elect a president there is something much stronger that grips our country that won't be solved this week. The thing is that so, from, so far from humility is this heaviness that we put on people. It makes poor people feel like they're nothing in our country. It makes those on the bottom feel worse about their condition. It makes people with color on their skin feel like they are less. It makes those who never got an education feel less. Recently, I heard a, a story of a couple. They gave birth to a child, a boy child. And this mother had grown up in a strong religious background, and she wanted to share with her son what had been shared with her. She told her boyfriend, I want to have my son christened. She went to the church, but the church told her, you're not married. And they turned away an opportunity to embrace and shape a child's life because of the relationship of the parents. Could the church today share some similarities with our ancestors? Could the church today be burdening people? Could the church be making people feel that they are not quite right? This sense that we know better. I grew up as a military child, and as such, every couple of years, we would go to a different place. We'd move, we'd pack up our stuff, and we'd go somewhere different. I ended up with some unique spaces, but I had to often start all over again. And one place I lived in was Guam, and there was a large military presence on the island of Guam. I made a few friends there, and one of my best friends one day invites me to her house. And at her home, they had this practice uh, that is not all that different from what I do today, but there it was something new. And as a child, it was new to me. When we entered her home, they asked me to take off my shoes. Well, why would I want to do that? <laughs> I had never been told to do that. But at 11 years old, it was a part of her family's custom to leave shoes at the front door and to retrieve them when you left. And because it was the expectation of that household, I did not want to offend. I took my shoes off as requested. I want to invite you all today to take your shoes off. If you were taught to feel superior in some kind of way through religion, you don't have to share that question or what even God may lay on your heart right now. But maybe you were, and maybe it's time to take off your shoes at the front door. It's so funny that what I started doing at my friend's house, I now do at my own home. Reminding me that every culture, every group, every body, no matter their lot in life, even the person begging on the street for money, can teach us, and maybe that's humility. Understanding that we all are equal, really, we are. And I mean, I know we get that theoretically, but do we get it in our hearts? 
This whole country, America, was founded by people who came to another country while some other people were already living in the country and took over. Humility calls us out of complacency and conformity in single narratives. Humility calls us to see the effects of national and global trauma, natural and human disaster. Humility calls us to see where other people live in the seat of exhaustion and loss. Humility calls religious institutions, organized religion that bask in rituals and celebrations to look at the ways in which it continues to perpetuate practices that refute renewal and transformation and make others feel like they can never quite fully belong. Last year, I had a community member come to me and she was so embarrassed and full of shame that the church had given her that she already felt condemned. Humility allows us to hear the pain and anguish of others without being fragile and defensive ourselves. Humility allows us to see the injustices happening on our planet and to our planet and demand justice for the weary. Humility not only allows us to see clearly what is happening in our world, but what is happening inside of us. Jesus said of the Pharisees, you can listen to them, but... Don't follow these people. They know the right thing, but they do not live it. They make statements about justice and inclusivity and then do nothing to reform the systems born out of injustice and exclusivity. They celebrate their distinctiveness, but then allow difference to dissolve into dissension and dissonance. They contend that their spaces are places of safety and refuge and then turn away when there are those who have nowhere else to go, not lifting a finger to help them. They say they are Christians and yet remain silent about even deny white privilege and racism. They claim the worth of all human beings and then sit back and stay silent about sexism or disbelieve claims of sexual harassment. They preach and teach that they are all made in the image of God and yet do not speak up for our LGBTQ sisters and brothers as leaders, both political and pastoral, call themselves public servants and then seek only their own gain. As pastors and politicians call upon the name of God to justify their speech and actions and yet disregard and displace the very people Jesus loves so much. These words are straightforward. They do not practice what they preach. They do not practice what they preach. Jesus made a connection in this text today with humility and serving others, which I imagine is the practicing of what you say. A long time ago in college, I got a check from my father. And you know, that was before the days of Zelle and cash apps and all the other ways we can send money. And as I told you before, I lived in Guam, and so my dad sent this check, and so it took some time to come around the planet and for this check to get to me. But this check came, and it was a big check, and already I was beginning to think of how I was going to spend this money, and I was excited. And after me and my BFF left the cafeteria, I noticed the check was missing. Uh-oh, it's right. I only could come to one conclusion, that I had left the check on the tray. And so I approached the people that worked in the kitchen, they had not seen a check, but they invited me to come in and dig through the garbage if I so pleased. Let me tell you, college students throw away a lot of food. I'm just going to put that out there. And so I began to dig through trash, which was, was quite hard. I didn't have gloves, and there was a lot of slime and a lot of stuff. But I kept digging because I wanted to get my check. And I knew that it was going to take a month to get another check. And I looked and I looked, and I went through several trash cans. And I felt really low after digging through all of that trash. And there was no check. And so I came back outside. My friend had been waiting, and she too looked awkward and in pain as well. I had been gone for some time because I was looking for my money. Y'all know how we feel about our money. <laughs> 
and I was looking for my money. I ran to the bathroom to wash my hands, to wash my arms, to rid myself of an experience that was totally, totally humiliating. My friend came in and at that time, she revealed what had attempted to be a prank and she pulled out the check. Now y'all know this was a prank that didn't go good. This was a prank where she had not anticipated that I would be in the cafeteria so long in the back. But it was also a prank that opened my eyes. I saw people whose names I did not know that were working on my behalf. I saw folks who got paid a minimum wage in black and white checkered pants cleaning and slaving in a kitchen. They were hidden away from the college students, but they were working, and I had not seen them before. Those were mostly my people. While I was away at a predominantly white college in a racist town, Prince Edward, look it up, Virginia, here were my people in the kitchen working hard. And in that moment, I felt humbled. Humble. Today I began with a group of people that sat around a table and they're on this journey together and they get together once a month for two and a half hours and they talk about equity. These people were asked from all walks of life, Jewish, male, woman, heterosexual, gay, to sit around a table, educated, and to talk about on this second meeting about how they're taught to feel superior to others. At the same table, they were invited to speak. In this conversation, everyone gets a chance to talk, but only once per question. They do what is called talking by invitation. One person starts the question and starts the answer and invites another to speak. And when that person is done, they invite another until everyone has spoken. No one gets to dominate. No one gets to go on because they love to hear themselves talk. Every person gets a chance. And the person that normally wouldn't say anything but has loads and loads of wisdom is invited to speak. It's spontaneous and open. I think Jesus today was trying to quiet the Pharisees, trying to help them not be so stuck on their goodness, trying to help them humble themselves just a little bit. He who exalts himself shall be humbled. Trying to help them see beyond themselves. He was creating a space for equity so that those who have more realize it does not make them any better. And those who work in the kitchen should know that they're just as important as those who do not. And that way we are all invited to this table today. We're invited to this relationship with God as we invite others. Humility is a gift. And it's not something they teach in schools, and it's not something you get in the workplace, and it's not something Americans do really well. But humility is a gift. And somewhere along the path of serving others, you'll run right dead smack into it. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word. Just as it may have irritated and challenged the Pharisees, let it irritate and challenge us. Just as they felt themselves growing angry at the truth of Jesus' words, may we find ourselves opened and revealed and know that, like Jesus calls all people to a table of equity, and humility, God calls us. And in calling us, we can find humility on the road of service. Continue to open our eyes to the ways in which you have been so generous to us. We ask all these things in your precious son's name. 
Jesus. Amen.